All right, Mr. Segura, I went a little long. I apologize for going a little long, but it was a good convo. I was enjoying it, so there you go. Uh, it was fun. Where are you at there? Where are you at this, hon? There he is. There we go. He is the queso blanco to my hot chocolate. There he is. He was making it on Instagram yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Had a little breakfast. Had arepa, chocolate. Wow. With cheese. There, that's, I mean, that's about as close cool as right there. I'm out here, man. Bro, bring a tear to my wife's eye, son. <laughs> All right, we don't have time to waste because I went a little over uh, board with him, but um, let's do it. Let's get to these calls. What do we got? All right, let's do it. Well, it wasn't a, a busy weekend in MMA, but, like, man, we got a lot of questions and a lot of them surrounding bare knuckle boxing. So let's go straight into let's it. Let's jump into it. Hey, Luke and Danny. This is Sean calling from Fresno, California, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Luke, I checked out Big Mouth Strikes again. Really good song, by the way. My question is, what did you think of the Artem Lobov Jason Knight fight, if you saw it? And does it raise your interest at all in bare knuckle fighting? Thanks. So I did see it. Um, I was at once uh, entertained. I was at once concerned and also a little bit horrified. Um, there has been a lot made that bare knuckle is better for you than with the gloves. I'm not sure I believe that. Yep. I'm not sure I believe that. Now, here's what the, here's what I'm saying. I'm also not saying it's not true, Danny, but their faces were badly cut up in ways that you don't typically see. Mm. Look, I've seen every injury with MMA, but there's a certain rhythm to what the injuries look like. Yes. This seemed to be like if these guys go for five rounds, they don't knock each other out, their faces are going to look like they got attacked by a dog, which they do. Yeah, yeah. How much I forgot which fighter tweeted out a photo of Jason Knight and right next to it a, a, a photo of Chucky. Yeah, dude, they got and you couldn't tell the difference. It was torn apart, so that was weird. Man, it was, yeah, and then you know how much brain damage did they take? No one really knows. It's like, dude, they're going through all that. I mean, I'm you know apparently BKFC is paying people more than normal, but yeah. God, man, that's a hard way to make a living. That's a really hard way to make a living. Yeah. Plus, you know these uh, these are essentially the money makers, right? Like if if you have hand problems, man, that can really hinder your career and. You know, gloves definitely protect that and, and, and give your hands a little bit of longevity. Whereas in bare knuckle, man, some of those hands are swollen up and, and you look at the way their hands were looking, they were looking pretty battered. So, you know, it's not only the face, but 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 also these, you know, mm. the hands. What did you think? Did you like it? You know what? It was entertaining. I mean, bare knuckle has been around for a little bit. Like I remember watching uh, Joy Beltran versus uh, Tony Lopez, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And man, that was exciting. And Casey and Esther went to that event and covered it. And I'm like, yo, this is great. But then as more events have rolled out, to be honest, like it's kind of losing a little bit of interest, at least on my end, because with MMA, you get so many different looks, right? The wrestling guy, the jujitsu guy, sambo, judo, you know, all kinds of striking. Whereas this, I kind of feel like it's a lot more, it's a lot of brawling, man. And, and it, don't, don't get me wrong. I love brawls. I love, you know, those type of wars, like the the Jason Knight and Artem Lobov, but I mean, at some point, it's kind of like I'm not saying it gets old, but it's kind of repetitive. I don't know if you feel the same. It way. just seems like I don't know. It, it is just a, the, what what keeps MMA going is the creativity. Yes, and this seems a little bit more one note. Let's have some violence and exactly. um, so it's again, it's like a cupcake with just the frosting. I love frosting, but what makes a cupcake work is the marriage of both frosting and the spongy cake. Yeah. So, will I watch it? Yes, but I'm still more of a fan of MMA, even though it could be, you know, more boring and whatnot or have less action. Um, so, you know, to sum this question up, I saw it, I liked it, but, eh, I mean, I don't know. It's not really my thing. Yeah. Also concerned about their health. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, I I do gotta say, I think I think. Um, actually, I'll just save my thoughts and we'll tackle yeah. this question and and I can. Let's burn through these thoughts. if we can. Yeah. All right, here's the next. I'll hey, cut Luke, this one short. Semper Fidelis, brother. This is Verlin calling from Seattle, Washington. Hey, man, just wanted to hear your take on the with the you know the bare knuckle uh, fighting coming out, and you know the recent fight with the Russian Hammer, and I mean, great fight. Um, I just want to know your take on what does this do for MMA? Um, do you think it kind of sets us back and and raises some light on the violence? Are people going to be shocked by that and just kind of lump them all into one group? Or, or do you think it's it's good? It gives fighters a, another revenue stream, somewhere to go. Right, um, I just want to hear your, yep. your honest take on it. 
All right, thanks. Yeah, so I mean, right. the general idea here is that, yes, it does give fighters another place to go. It gives yeah. a certain kind of fighter. Matt Brown was out there suggesting that these guys were B-class fighters. I, I, mm -hmm. That's not an insult. That's a fair classification. Uh, so, yes, it, it gives them. It definitely caters a type of fighter. I mean, we've seen Chris Lieben. We've seen well, yeah, right, he, Joey Bellatran. He was retired and coming out of it. Right. It's, a guy, it's guys who either wash out of the UFC or have been retired but still have a name. Um, but even then, like you, it's 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 the type of fighter. It's like the brawler. Yes, you know? and the, yeah. Obviously, Demi and Maya is not well situated yes. to do well in, yeah. in BKFC. To your point, yes. So look, it caters to a certain kind of fighter, both in the the, the position they're in their career and the, the way in which they fight. But again, we need to make sure that these guys get paid. We need to make sure that there's proper health screenings, and we need to monitor exactly what this does to a person because. A lot of this is uncharted territory. I mean, yes. people have said, oh, you know, bare knuckle used to exist back in the day, and it did, but it hasn't really for a long time. And to do it for five rounds, again, two minute or whatever it is, two minute yeah. rounds, that's still a lot of brawling bare knuckle, man. Yep. So their hands were messed up. Their faces were just really bad. Um, let's just see. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. But as far as it, what it does to me, I'm glad that it gives an outlet to, you know, fighters, you know. And uh, Pauli Malinaji, we had him in studio last week, and he was saying he was getting paid a lot of money, right? So, you know, it does give retired guys uh, an option to come back. It also it can produce other storylines. So, uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm the all question for... question is, should retired guys be coming back? That's also true, yeah. I mean, we'll see. It's it's all, as you said, uncharted territory. Yeah. So we'll, It's we'll so, it's so new, happens. it's hard to make firm conclusions. Yeah. All right. Um, now let's talk about the big fight coming up this weekend. Yes. Hey, it's Luke, be fun. Josh from Sydney, Australia. Uh, at this point in time, which of the main event fighters on UFC do you think 36, would you consider posing a bigger threat to Khabib's title? And on the same lines, which of the co-main event fighters is a worse stylistic matchup for Robert Whittaker? Thanks for all your hard work. All right, so we got two interim belts on the line, right? Uh, Gastelum going at it with Adesanya and then Holloway going at it with Poirier. Uh, which two of those guys, which, which, what, what, which guy could give their, their respective champion the biggest challenge? Um, so, you know, yeah. I think people know my preferences on this one. I made this point back when Max decided he wanted to fight Habib at UFC 223 and everything yeah. fell apart. Max's takedown defense is some of the best in MMA, period. Uh, maybe Habib takes him down. He takes down everybody, right? But the reality is the dude, Max Holloway, has incredible takedown defense. And if that fight stays on the feet at all, Max Holloway sets him on fire. Meanwhile, Dustin Poirier has good takedown defense as well. Don't misunderstand me. And a good ground game. But that's not where he's going to be best able to hurt Habib. So I'm going to say uh, we'll see how things go this weekend. But my hunch is Max Holloway. Yeah. On, I, you too? I think with that one is a bit of a toss-up. I, I, I'm not really sure. I think both guys are elite, obviously very skilled fighters. But uh, I'm leaning more towards Holloway given the style. But, uh, yeah, it's a tough one. Then on the middleweight side, I'm a little bit biased. I think I keep sleeping on Kelvin Gastelum. Yeah. And I think I always have. I'm not the best to give an opinion on Kelvin because I certainly respect him, but I keep misidentifying yes. how good he is. But you guys also know how I feel about Israel Adesanya. I think, look, the key insight to Israel Adesanya that nobody picks up on or talks about enough is the fainting. Those guys at City Boxing basically believe that fainting is the key to everything. And if somebody faints and the other guy doesn't or one person is mm -hmm. better at fainting than the other one, the fainter should always win. Israel Adesanya is one of the best fainters in the game. He yeah. really is. So, to me, the issue here is that um, I think as long as it's going to be a stand-up battle, he's going to be the better fainter than anyone in that division. So, I'm going to pick him. Yeah. But Whitaker is amazing, and I've been wrong about Gastelum so many goddamn times. Yeah, for sure. I, I think I'm going to go with Adesanya the same because I feel like Robert Whitaker has already gotten that look in his career, he's fought, you know, I mean, Yo Romero twice, a guy that, you know, can hold his own on the striking, but a really good wrestler, uh, you know, Jack Rick. Again, not exactly the same as Gastelum, but similar looks. Whether you go to Adesanya, is someone completely different, new, with a different style. Um, and Whitaker's not really the guy that will take you down, so he'll be fighting Adesanya where he feels most comfortable, you know, which is on the feet. So I I'm leaning towards Adesanya, but man, Whitaker... Whitaker's amazing, and, and, and so is Gaslam. So it's a tough pick. Certainly is. All right. Um, this is not really a question, more of a suggestion. So mm, let's hear it. All right. And a comment. There. Hey, Danny Luke. Tanner here from New Orleans. First off, love the show. Your recent appearance on Below the Belt with Brandon Schaub was absolutely amazing. Love how frank you are, and I love how pragmatically you view the world. 
on that note, I'd love to hear a similar type of interview with you and Josh Barnett on the MMA Hour, just chatting about life, metal, and philosophy. I don't know, for like an hour or so. That's all I got, guys. Cheers. Have fun. Yeah. Uh, now that he's at Bellator, Bellator's got to yeah, us up with I, an interview. I've invited Josh on. He thinks I don't like him, which is really? not true at all. I actually mm. like Josh a lot. I feel like you guys would have a lot in common. Yeah, I like Josh a lot. I once made a point about how Cyborg was mistreated yeah. and by MMA, uh, by the MMA community, and I used Josh as an example to make that point. And I think he thinks that I don't like him. Not true at all. I have total respect for Josh. And as I made quite clear during his feud with USADA, he was, I made clear to note he was totally railroaded and done wrong, which is unfortunate. But I am quite happy to see that he is back on his feet. He apparently had a grand weekend in um, – and what do you call it? Uh, he did a thing called Bloodsport here in the city? Yes. Or in Jersey, yeah. Yep. And then uh, he signed with Bellator. So he had a big weekend and a big week. So, yeah, he's got an open invite on the show at any time. I have, I have great respect for Josh Barnett and uh, glad to see he's got another. The War Master has another chapter. Yes. And at Bellator, which will be fun. There's a lot of good names there. Exactly. It's a, so. it's a good organization yes. for him. Yeah. It's a good organization if you're a heavy with a name, man. Yeah. It is. And he's still got, we, we don't actually know how talented he is. I mean, we know he is, but I'm saying what's left. But yeah. He hasn't had a lot of wear and tear in the last couple of years. Quite exactly, honestly. this so, break might have even been helpful. Exactly. So yeah, I would love to. I can't wait to see how he does. All right, now uh, let's uh, talk about your favorite topic. So okay. let's tackle that. Okay. Also, by the way, congrats on that uh, interview with Brandon Shaw. That was that was great stuff. You know what, man? Uh, you don't get a lot yeah, of thanks for a shout out. By the way. Yeah, of course. It was him too, but uh, him mostly, I should say. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I was really. Good you know what I noticed? You know what I took from that interview or the response to it? Yeah. I don't think people. I I've been on camera for years. I kind of took. I thought people understood me, and it turns out a lot of people just didn't realize who I was or didn't feel like they got to yeah. know me very well, and um, I guess that video went a long way towards showing like who I, based on the reception I'm getting, Danny. Yeah, yeah. People seem to know who I am better now, so um, I'm very grateful for that. You don't get a lot yeah. of opportunities like that, and that was one of them. Yeah, that was good stuff. All right, let's talk about some wrestling. I'd rather die. <laughs> What's up, Luke? This is Donk Donkerson from Shitsville, USA. I was just calling to get your opinion on WrestleMania. Have a great day. I'm I'm guessing you watched. I watched. You stayed all, up all night. I watched all of none of it. Um, yeah, I don't care. I mean, if people like it, great. Uh, what do you want me to say? I mean, it's uh, you know, all I'm going to do by answering this question is make everybody who had nice things to say after being on Brendan Shop's podcast bitter at me. If you all like professional wrestling, keep watching it. I yeah. I have tried. I have tried. It is I, it is insufferably I, awful. I do got to say, I think this is worth of note. Brock Lesnar lost, if I'm not mistaken, which could potentially set up a a comeback for him in, in MMA. He's still my heart. Uh, so we'll see. Great. Also, I did a, go to a pro wrestling show on Thursday, I think. Our own Mark Ramundi dragged me out there, and it, it was fun. It was I, I got to say, the indie one is a lot better than what you see on TV I've and heard WWE that. and all that. Because it's less how could, sh how, shady acting and all yeah, that. It's say, actually How like, could it be worse? That's true. <laughs> I mean, legitimately, how no, could it be it, worse? It, it's actually pretty good. It's it's a show. It's it's acrobatics. The guys are super yeah. athletic, and they're actually doing things that require a lot of skill. Well, and, 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 a lot, and a lot of the acting, which is horrible, it's it's all you know taken off so yeah my understanding is that the again i know nothing but my understanding yeah. is the uh, indie scene right now mm -hmm. is having something of a renaissance where yeah. the, really the best professional wrestling doesn't really exist in the wwe uh, again if it's something people like man i encourage you to keep watching yeah all right uh this is a fun question uh pretty creative from this caller so let's have a listen all right morning Luke and danny this is alex calling from orlando florida orlando uh, I just want to get your thoughts on WrestleMania last night. Just kidding. Um, you know, my question is, what is your favorite comic book superhero movie? Ooh. And if you could replace the main character from that movie with a current UFC fighter, who would it be? Thanks. Jesus. Um, and I'll go first because I had some time to think about this. All right, go first. So I'm not big into into comic books, and I don't. To be honest, I'm gonna catch some hate on this probably, but I'm not big into superhero movies a anyways. Uh, but one that I really like and respect, um, it's is the whole Dark Knight series. Mm. So my favorite is is Batman. I just thought you know it was uh, you know greatly shot. The the cast was great. Uh, everything about it was was great. Cheering for the billionaire, yeah. huh? So um, and if I had to pick an MMA fighter to replace Christian Bale, it would be Carlos Condit. I feel like he would fit in. He's got that that grit, you know. I don't know. Yeah. Beard. Um. Boy. 
Natural Born Killer. That's a good one. Um, let me think. Let me think. Um, favorite one. Well, The Dark Knight was good, obviously. Um, favorite of all time. Good Lord, there are a bunch of them. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, I really enjoyed yeah. Avengers Infinity War, which I know is the, la the latest of the big ones. Um, the best one I saw recently was the animated one, which was um, Into the Spider-Verse. Did you see it? No. Oh, it's phenomenal. I heard it was good. It's phenomenal. Look at the look at the Rotten Tomatoes ratings for yeah. audiences and critics. Um, I would say the you know which one I really liked as a kid the animated Batman series. It's dark and brooding, and there's not a lot of dialogue. It's really really good. I, I was the best. It was the best comic book series ever brought to life. So, which was also Batman, obviously. Um, so yeah, I guess I don't know I, who had I replace him with. You know what? Just to have a little fun, Mike Perry. Let's make yeah. let's make Mike Perry the new Batman. Can you imagine how great that would yeah. be? That would be fun. Uh, so there you go. Different kind of that Batman. Yeah. For sure. All right. You have time for one more? Yeah, let's do this one. We can do maybe a couple more. All right, cool. This is a bit of an old question, but I feel like with what's happened with UFC and the ESPN pay per view deal, it has changed the conversation a bit. So okay. Let's let's hear it. Hey man, this is Christian from uh, St. Louis. Called a little earlier, but I uh, I don't think I specified enough. Um. So my question is. Why are we not talking about the fact that there's way too much weight jumping between champs? Uh, Holloway Poye is fine. I get that. And I said that when I dropped the call earlier. But Henry Cejudo should be defending his own belt against 25ers. Why is he moving up to 35 to defend it or to fight for the belt when TJ's no longer in it? It made sense when TJ was around. TJ's not around anymore. Yeah. That beef doesn't make sense anymore. So why does that fight make sense? Marlon Mariah should be fighting somebody right. else. We'll cut it right there, but you, yeah. you get it, right? Yeah, I don't understand either, other than that's what they probably think is best for sales and or... Okay, yeah, but it, yeah, it's best for sales, but with the UFC ESPN pay-per-view deal, which guarantees them an upfront, right? Yeah. Which it's supposed to be a, a pretty fat uh, sum of money. I mean, does it even matter the, the ratings all that much anymore? Right, like yeah, it does a little bit. I mean, look on some level, exactly a little bit. But here's like, what I would say: you don't have to worry about putting on a pay per view that's going to do 170 or something like that because well, you know, you're I don't support this decision. But on the other hand, we need to be careful about what we're arguing here. You do not want the matchmakers in the UFC so immune to market pressures that they no longer feel beholden to them and they can go purely in a sporting context. Because here's the reality: using the matchmaker model to well, hold on, yeah. let me finish. Using the matchmaker model to subvert pure sporting criteria not all the time but sometimes is going to end you up in a better place yeah i don't agree with the call here uh i do think that cejudo should be fighting 125ers but i guess my point is danny you do want them to feel market pressure so if they're if they're responding in a way where they are i don't agree with this call but i like that general instinct but okay so if, if you had to do like a line of you know i guess like market pressure and and then I guess from the sporting standpoint, don't you think perhaps, at least on my view, I feel like we're a little more leaning towards market pressure than we are on the sporting side. Sure, we absolutely are. They get, they're getting right? this one wrong. So wouldn't wouldn't the ESPN deal being exclusive to pay-per-view, wouldn't that help that and, and at least bring it back and balance it a little more? Sure. I just don't want folks to say, what does it matter anymore? It matters a lot. Right, yeah, of course. Because it's not about maximizing sales as such. It's about what the mentality is about maximizing sales, which is making sure MMA is big enough that it stays big, relevant yeah. enough in 100%. people's consciousness. Yeah, that's uh, the point I'm making. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know. I still would. I know we've talked about this at length, but like, I, I would still love to see Henry Cejudo defend the belt at 125. Even if you're gonna close that division, all right, fine. You know, keep releasing the guys that you're releasing, but ha have the guy defend the belt a couple times. I agree. You know? Absolutely I agree. All right, uh, one more. One, you're out of here. One more. One more. Okay, do you want to talk about um, the chances Holm and Santos have or USADA and the Lifetime Ban? USADA and the Lifetime Ban. All right, I knew it. Let's do it. I'm going to cut this one short. Hey, uh, Luke and Danny. It's Mike from Philadelphia. actually went to a UC Philadelphia, had a great time. Um, the stadium was a lot, uh, a lot fewer people than I, than I expected. It was about maybe half full. Uh, my question is about... USADA. If you get a lifetime ban from USADA, does that immediately nullify your UFC contract? I mean, there's no way they can keep it in a contract, right? Um, is this a backdoor somehow to getting out of UFC contracts if you were willing to go that far? 
Also, um, do we know if USADA can and UFC can give you, say, a five-year ban or a 10-year ban? Just wondering about how long people can be locked up and uh, not fighting. All right. Thanks. Bye. So, okay, two answers to that. Yeah. Let's start with the uh, first one. The UFC has to give you fights. If they can't because you're banned by USADA, I believe that they are contractually obligated to release you. You, you will see Ruslan Magomedov if he continues to fight. You'll see him in some overseas promotion, uh, whether it's Japan or... What's the threshold of time? Like, Because, like, say, TJ Dillashaw gets here. I mean, he's got at least a one-year ban, right? Yeah. I mean, they can't give him fights, obviously. Yeah, I haven't seen the language, but the idea there is that um, it's only temporary. Okay. Uh, they would presumably be able to do it at some future date. So I think. I mean, it, if it's if it's lifetime, you're out. I, I yeah. think what happens is it freezes the contract. But okay. if you're if there's no point at which you can be unfrozen, then they're not able to fulfill the terms of it. In which case, the thing becomes null and void. So look, I, he is going to be fighting if he continues to fight in some. You know, he'll fight for. He fought for uh, Ahmad MMA, I believe. Uh, so he'll fight for you know Ramzan Kadyrov or Ryzen or somebody. You know, so he, yeah. he's not going to fight again. He'll fight again. Um, first, second of all. By the way, he could end up fighting for Bellator because he might serve a suspension according to the commissions. But once that's over, they're not going to lifetime ban him. So he, you could see him in bits. And they can't, and they don't have to respect you, Sada. They certainly do not. Um, yeah. So there's that. So as for the second part, could they ban you five or ten years? Well, here's where it comes from. You see these things like two and four and eight years. Yeah. This comes from uh, the Olympic cycle. This is where it comes from. The idea is that right. you have the Olympics every four years. You have the World Championships typically every year. They And this didn't get instituted until 2014 or 2015, or maybe 2013, 2014. Um, these are all still relatively new because Danny, as I, I keep trying to tell people, everything they keep trying keeps failing, so they keep ratcheting it up. And the next level is to criminalize it, of course. They're going to throw people in jail over this, um, which they're literally trying to do. Uh, in any event, so the the idea there is it would get you to miss certain cycles. Yeah. This Olympic cycle, two Olympic cycles. Presumably you could get an arbitration panel to then reduce or up a four-year suspension to five or reduce eight to five or up eight to ten. But typically it goes in those two to four to eight-year increments yeah. and maybe an arbitration panel could fudge it. Yeah. And why are we using these cycles if this is a year-round sport? Right. It's a professional sport with a narrow-ass yeah. window and we barred it from an Olympic cycle, which has nothing to do with the way in which our sports operate. Our sports operate yeah. on a you know month to month I mean, basis. Basically, anything, any suspension five years or above is pretty much a, a death sentence in MMA. Like yeah. you're, you're done unless you're right? twenty or something or twenty five. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, but even then, it would be horribly destructive. So yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, you're gonna get a lot of people sympathizing. But the question is not about being going easy on them. The question is what kind of policies can you reasonably enact to either minimize the harms that these things cause. That's that's the that's the answer. And the answer is. Just the get tough policy. It didn't work for any other drug in the war on drug. I don't know why people are confused and think it's going to work for this one, but okay. People have decided they would like to see this fail before they come around to my position. So.